Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming today and welcome to the Sazalman Cohen Center at Victoria University. Um, if we haven't met before, my name is Nyaro Nyon and I'm the executive director of the center. Before I say more about this wonderful center, I want to, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands in which you and I meet today, the Kulin, um, the people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. We live in a country that is built on a continent where First Nations people have maintained continuous connection to these lands for over 60,000 years. Today, the challenge of how we live with each other, recognize each other, and face our history remains unsettled and perhaps to some divisive. It is in this context that acknowledging country cannot be a mere formality. I hope it always serve as a reminder to all of us who care that it is our part and our duty to work towards a society that is fair, just and more reconciled with itself and hopefully with its history at some point. At the centre here, I'm quite lucky to be supported by a team and others who I think contributes to that future in our small way. And we draw inspiration from the life and legacy of the late Sazelman Cohen. Sazelman had a lifelong interest in education and the creation of equal opportunities for all, as well as the sharing of ideas. This year, we hosted the first Lawyers as Changemakers series. In that series, we discovered that Sazelman was a mentor to a young man from Nigeria who came here at the height of the white Australian policy. He came here to study a PhD at Melbourne University. At the completion of his PhD, he wrote a dedication that really captures the role that I think mentors can take. He thanked Sazelman for being a mentor, for encouraging him even when he felt he would have dropped out. We were lucky to have his son here last time in this very room, Ike Nkoli, to speak about his father and to draw our attention to a connection to Sazelman that we didn't know existed. And so now we've asked him if he can work with us so we can continue to discover more people. We also learned through a speech by the Attorney General Mark Truffis, who also spoke about the life and the legacy of Sazelman, about the way in which he was a leader, especially for legal academics, encouraging them to think about the broader national life and not to just think in the limits of nav navigating legal doctrines. I like to think that that's the function of the Sazelman Cohen Center here. We work to enhance community understanding of the law, to try and demystify the law, but to also try to treat them as active agent and, civil, and active agents to participate in civil life. And we also work with members of the legal sector to try and improve their understanding of community legal needs. We achieve this through our programs and projects, some of which I'll mention later on, but also by holding this public event. The annual Sazelman Cohen Center Oration is our main public education program, and we offer it as a platform to address topics concerned with the promotion of fairness, equality, and inclusion in Australian society. Tonight, we gather to hear about this topic in the context of sport. And I'm so excited that we've got a wonderful guest speaker to be able to address this topic. If you ask me, I think the only person we could have to speak on this topic. But I will not make the introduction. I'll invite um, Professor Adam Shoemaker, the Vice Chancellor of Victoria University, to introduce our guest speaker tonight. The fifth of Fitzroy. Thank you. Colleagues, it's amazing to be here in this venue. Just 24 hours ago, we also heard Julian McMahon, AOSC, talking about advocacy in the law worldwide, locally, in Bali, everywhere. And all of us, in one way or another, can be advocates. And I think it's important measure of advocacy to not just acknowledge country, as you have done so brilliantly, but also to bear in mind and I'll just push, pull this back a little bit. I'm getting a bit of echo. Is that a bit better? 
And also just to bear in mind the fact that it's a very fraught time, a very fraught time over the next two to three weeks in this country for First Nations people and for everyone who's an elector. It's not an easy time. There's a lot of angst in the community. And so when we acknowledge, we acknowledge that as well. We don't know the results, but we know this, that listening and understanding and truly hearing is going to be so essential in the next months. And it begins, we believe, with events like this, where we learn together. So it is a really amazing pre pleasure of mine to say that we're here together to learn. And you might call it a weekend which is related to a sporting event on Saturday. One might. And I think it's also worth remembering the, the value of sport and the importance of sport globally to do other things than just be victors, but as platforms for change and understanding. And here at Victoria University, one of the reasons I came is that sport isn't just competition. We don't just teach and research about it. We look at it, whether it's women in sport, whether it's you know, nutrition in sport, whether it's biomechanics, whatever it may be, how it can influence populations, population health, how it can influence inclusion. And in fact, as you know, the Afghan women's football team, otherwise known as soccer, is a very proud involvement with this university and with others. We're proud to sponsor them in that same sort of theme. So being ranked in the world is one thing. Top 10 in the world is one thing, but it's really what we do daily in that venue, which is important. So as we step into this, even more so this global economy that we see, universities are thrust into a kind of situation, and Craig and I were talking about this before, where we have to be, I think, more open in our speech, in our speech about the abuse of speech, frankly, and social media. And so we're going to be doing that in the future more, I can guarantee it. But there are many, many sporting bodies in this state, more than 200 with which this university has relationships. And through those, and through our alumni all over the world. I was saying just recently we had graduations. And the international theme in Melbourne is one of which we are so proud that maybe a thousand people were, were present for each graduation. At the end, we asked the audience to just put their hands up and say, how many of you speak more than two languages at home? 90%. How many three languages? 75%. How many four languages? 50%. And this went on and more to even six languages. And this was the West of Melbourne, the future of the nation here, now, and powerful. We were so proud of it in that moment. And I'm proud also tonight. So let me go on to our speaker, uh, Craig Foster. Now, I've had the pleasure of meeting Craig in many different environments, including in the library of Southern Cross University in Lismore, where, as you may know, he's one of the best known uh, former residents, and his parents still live in that city. I had four of the most fascinating and, and sometimes difficult years of my life living in Lismore as the Vice Chancellor of Southern Cross, but we adored it. The natural beauty is unbelievable, and the natural beauty of the people is unbelievable, but the climate is very challenging. And I don't mean the weather. I mean the climate. There's a big difference. But I want to introduce Craig tonight and to say that I don't know of anyone who knows more and has done more in the area of the power of sport for change and to re reduce limitations. There are those in sporting endeavors who are boundary riders and those who are boundary keepers, but those who boundary break are the really significant ones. And Craig, you are one of those. Can I welcome you? Thank you. And you may know from SBS or other work uh, that Craig has undertaken, his work in multiculturalism, refugee support, the organizations, many, and of course, involved in, in his involvement in New South Wales as New South Wales Australian of the Year. How fantastic is that? And chair of the Australian Republican movement. So we decided, both of us, though we didn't plan in advance, that t-shirts would be the order of the day tonight. And you'll notice Craig's, when he comes to speak, is very much in that because they speak to us about, we are talking about inclusion and the future of this nation. And Craig is also a member of the Australian Multicultural Council under the Department of Home Affairs, Immigration and Citizenship. And he works across a wide range of social programs for First Nations rights, self-determination, homelessness, domestic violence, climate action and gender equality. It's a fabulous array. 
and, and you're particularly well known, as you know, for your activism and refugee advocacy. That's why I picked that word at the beginning. It comes back again. Without advocates, we're silenced. And without ears, ears to listen, we don't enjoy that advance. So finally, Craig was part of a team of advocates who worked to secure the evacuation and resettlement of over 100 Afghani citizens from Kabul in 2021. And that included, as I mentioned before, the Afghan national women's football team. It all comes back in a circular way. So we are incredibly proud, Craig, to have you here to honor and to sponsor them as people, to honor and, and your presence as well. And we cannot wait to learn more from what you have to say. Craig, floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, very much the uh, Evening Forward t-shirts. That's very true. Thank you, Adam. It's lovely to be here uh, and a great pleasure and privilege to be able to join you all this evening and uh, to talk about what are some, uh, I think, really, really important things. Thank you very much for Niadol uh, for the invitation to what is a, a hugely prestigious uh, event, oration and a centre with uh, immense impact. I uh, congratulate you on the work you do. Thank you to all your staff. Uh, for all your work over recent months to bring this to life. I very much appreciate it. I want to also acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land, uh, particularly at this time in Australian history. Uh, we're just several weeks away from one of the most important decisions that Australia is ever going to have to make, uh, something that I'm tremendously inspired by. And we might talk a little bit about that tonight. So we're talking about sport, and I noticed that you had a nice sport uh, uh, video on up there. That was great, although you had a lot of cycling going on. I don't know about any of you, but I'm a hopeless cyclist, so it probably would be better with some of the other sports, some of the football or something. Uh, but I'm going to weave a sport into our conversation this evening. Sport has a really strong responsibility as a powerful, hugely influential social institution uh, and political institution uh, to contribute to what Australia and the rest of the world looks like in future. And that's going to be the focus of the talk tonight. So sport will be part, but more than that, uh, we're going to focus on the fact that this year is 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And let's look ahead to perhaps what the next 75 years will bring. But we're going to take an optimistic view. Uh, I'm both an optimist and an activist. I think you need to be both, uh, to certainly to be uh, an activist. And let's consider some of the big issues that are facing Australia and the rest of the world. And just project forward a few years to a place where, we, uh, where we've solved some of them. And I think in so doing, Australia is going to put ourselves at the forefront of some really important, difficult, complex global issues, from climate to human mobility, uh, and perhaps take the lead in some areas where we've done quite the opposite in recent years. The world is in the midst of a fundamental shift in reassessing the basis of society, certainly post-COVID, sustainability, equality, and this can be overwhelming for us all at times. And the last few months have been brutal for First Nations people, and I think also for many Australians. There are so many issues to solve sometimes. I would like us all to be advocates, but I recognise that it can be tough. It can be overwhelming. There's so much self-interest and narrow short-term politics holding both us back and much of the world. And we can feel that we're fighting against intractable, immovable objects. So perhaps it's a good night tonight to inject some optimism for us all. So let's for a moment just assume that humanity finds the path to necessary change. Sport will be a big part of that. And I believe that we can and will. And let's look at what the world looks like over the next 75 years. Firstly, Food security, a world where everyone has enough to eat, starting in Australia. The number of people in extreme poverty rose by 70 million to more than 700 million people this year alone. 
The global extreme poverty rate reached over 9%, up from just over 8 in recent years, and the world's poorest people bore the steepest costs of the pandemic. But let's look at home. Not everyone has enough to eat in Australia. Just a couple of weeks ago, I spent some time at a conference with uh, New South Wales Aboriginal Services. And the conference was called, and get this, Food Equity. Food Equity. And much of the day was spent talking about different systems, different policies, different organisations, different departments of government, how everyone can work together. But at the start and at the end, we had to acknowledge that access to food is not just about policy. Access to food is about inclusion and exclusion. Access to food is about who is worthy and who is unworthy. Access to food is about who we care about and who we're comfortable leaving behind. Food is just the prism through which we see discrimination, and inequality and First Nations communities all around the country are at the very forefront of that. I've had the pleasure in recent years of volunteering and as the ambassador for a little community organisation in Sydney and Marrickville called Addison Road. It was actually the birthplace of multiculturalism 50 years ago this year, which is pretty extraordinary in many ways. And Addison Road is incredible because it uses access to food and people's basic need to feed themselves, to feed their children, for, to feed their family. Not next week, not next month, not planning about next year. I'm talking about tonight, today, an issue that most of us in this room have never had to contend with in our life. And we, Addison Road, we use food as the vehicle to bring people to the centre to help to listen and to help solve so many other problems. And during COVID, we saw how just university students in Sydney were left aside, cast aside. And we had several hundred coming every week just to pick up food hampers. But while they were there, we provided them with a visa help, with legal help, with haircuts, with things that they simply couldn't afford, with places to stay. And yet, like so many other people in Australia today, we have to ask the question, how in 2023, in contemporary Australia, wealthy Australia, this is acceptable? We talked during COVID about people falling through the cracks. What an odd term. <laughs> the cracks. I became so sick of that term. Why are there cracks? Where are the cracks? Why didn't we see these cracks before? How do we allow cracks to occur? And if there's cracks, why don't we fix them? <laughs> so many people falling through. And during that time, how many times do we keep saying, we're all together? Do you remember? We're all in this together. No one is going to miss out how quickly we withdrew that pledge. Recently, we saw record profits from major supermarkets. Record profits as, as the cost of living and the cost of basic items continues to rise. And I read the report of one of those uh, oligopolies and in it it said that one of the problems the supermarkets are facing is that food crime is up. Food theft, they called it. Food theft. We talk about a lot about that at Addison Road, where over 400 people come every day just to get a box of food. We know that people are in a, a place where they, they can't feed themselves and they can't feed those they love around them, which includes their pets. And so people are going into these shops and taking what they need, not what they desire, but what they need today. So perhaps in future, given that access to food is a basic human right 
in the Universal Declaration 75 years ago. And yet, on that anniversary today, we still see so many people suffering. Our food distribution and production, as many of you know, is also a very significant issue. And 80% of people living below the global poverty line are based in rural areas. And the majority of these depend on agriculture for their livelihoods. But small scale farms are highly efficient and localized food production, producing around 35% of global food on just 12% of agricultural land. And yet there's an assault on many of these communities and farmers in relation to their ownership of uh, their historical seed production and the ability to commercialize their own work. In fact, in Kenya, some years ago, a law was passed that prohibited farmers' rights to save, share, exchange, or sell what's called unregistered seeds. Can you imagine? <laughs> unregistered seeds. Every seed is a meal. Every seed is a person fed. And yet, they could face up to two years in prison and a, a fine of up to one million Kenyan shillings, equivalent to four years' wages for a farmer. Food is a human right. Perhaps in future we can say, let's go local. Housing too is a human right. Let's look ahead and say that every person in Australia will have a roof over their head. What do you think? Is it too much to ask? Homelessness is on the rise here in Australia. Imagine the housing crisis and rising financial stress are pushing more than 1,600 people into homelessness. 1,600 every month as demand for sheltering services soars. You see the language? The sheltering services. What about a house? What about a home? What about a dwelling for family? Women and children make up 74% of those accessing services. And as you mostly will know, uh, women over 55 who face a range of other social and economic barriers, including access to stable work, are the fastest growing cohort of homeless Australians. Having a roof over our head, for obvious reasons, is a basic human right. And yet it's not one that we feel strongly enough in Australia to uphold. How can it not be a priority if we talk about equality? How can it be that not everyone is yet housed? A charter of rights with these basic fundamentals is a must in coming decades in Australia. And that's in part how we bring to life these basic human rights. A future Australia where everyone is housed. And it's not even a question. It's just a right. What about the right to protest? In future, let's see that protected and valued. We're seeing oppressive fines used to support and protect largely polluting industries from concerned citizens instead of fines for the environmental degradation that's killing the planet. You may know of a recent case, Deanna Violet in New South Wales, imprisoned for protesting climate inaction. In different parts of the country, there are fines of up to $22,000 and up to two years in jail for anyone found to have blocked major infrastructure in a way which seriously disrupts or obstructs vehicles or pedestrians. Coco's imprisonment, according to the former Premier of New South Wales, was pleasing to see. And get this, if protesters want to put our way of life at risk, Sorry, if protesters want to put our way of life at risk, oh, it's the protesters, then they should have the book thrown at them. Hang on. Our way of life, as you heard from Adam, I'm from Lismore. 
and I know where our way of life is headed. I know how our way of life is at risk. I've seen thousands and thousands of people lose their homes. I've seen New South Wales and Australia not yet capable or ready to mitigate these circumstances and these new level of disasters. We've seen bushfire upon bushfire, flood upon flood, from Libya to Pakistan to Bangladesh, all around the world. And yet it's protesters who are the problem. Perhaps in future we can say that the right to protest, indeed, let's go further, the responsibility to protest and to be advocates, if not activists, for all of us, every Australian is part of the future of Australia. How about whistleblowers? Let's envision a future where whistleblowers are respected and I would say congratulated because isn't that what should happen? These courageous people who speak out against government tyranny, against injustice, against corruption that citizens would otherwise never know. And yet, so many of them, including in Australia, are on the wrong end of justice. They're delivering justice for us. I don't have to remind you about Julian Assange, who continues to be in prison more than 10 years after uh, uh, escaping to the Colombian embassy and is still in danger of extradition to the US. Recently, uh, a group of uh, Australian members of parliament uh, put together a statement and are going across to the UK to advocate for Julian. And in that statement, it said that extradition would trigger outrage. Extradition would trigger outrage. I wonder why we're not outraged already. David McBride, a former army lawyer, will face a criminal trial in November for his alleged role in leaking defence documents regarding allegations of war crimes committed by Australian military personnel in Afghanistan. Is that not something we have a right and we deserve to know? We are quite literally shooting the messenger. Richard Boyle too is fighting 24 charges, spoke out internally then to an independent watchdog and to the media in 2018 about the Australian Taxation Office's aggressive pursuit of tax debts from small businesses. Do you see shadows of robo-debt there? How much of a chilling effect do these pursuits of brave truth-tellers have on public servants? And I wonder, how many in future would have the courage to speak up against robo-debt before it gets underway? How many people were harmed? How many suicides occurred? How many families were in trouble from a policy that never should have been implemented? And who had the opportunity to speak out and didn't? We need to encourage truth-telling to power to hold government accountable, and those people should be respected, thanked, even commended. The future of Australia and the world has to be a place where asylum seekers and refugees are welcome, where they're considered human, and that's still a big leap, where Australia understands the drivers of human mobility have worked out a sane and worked to continue to develop a sane global system and acknowledge that we contribute to many of the drivers of mobility. The Refugee Convention, as most of you know, was drawn up following the Second World War in 51 and has its 
at its centre the principle that refugees should not be returned to countries where they face threats to their life or freedom. And yet, in the last 20 years at least, Australia has physically, psychologically tortured thousands and thousands of people fleeing persecution. Just a few years ago, I had an opportunity to travel to Port Moresby in PNG to see for myself what we were doing as a country. And I met the main leaders of the various ethnicities uh, within who had been stuck on Manus Island and by this time were abandoned in PNG. And what I saw changed my life. Before I went working with Amnesty on the trip, they said, we have to sit down and have some training for you because you're walking into a really dangerous environment. I said, okay, when I sat down with a psychiatrist and they said, the number one rule, Craig, that you need to understand is don't give any hope. Don't give any hope. And I said, what are you talking about? And I, I, I don't understand. And they said, because what's happened to the people there offshore under Australia's care has been so harmful that these people are in a position where they've been let down time and time and time again. And if you provide some kernel of hope, or they think you are, and they're once again let down, then they're in such a parlous state that that can lead to the worst possible consequences. And I saw people in this compound with burns all over their arms, on their necks, on their legs, with cuts all over their body. And I heard many, many stories of harm, of tragedy, and much of that tragedy was due to our policy. Speaking to Beres Bukshani and some of the others that you may have heard of, and a man walked up and said to me, do you have a resettlement offer for me? And I said, I'm sorry, sir. I'm not here for that. I'm just here to speak to some of the other gentlemen. If you'd like, do you have a resettlement offer for me? And he just kept chanting a sentence that he could barely even enunciate. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, but this gentleman here is from Amnesty. Please come here and if you'd like to ask these questions, this man can help you. And, and I shuffled away in tears. And one of the other gentlemen came up and said, do you know who that is? And they said, that man is from Iran and he's been here over six years. And before he fled, he was a neurosurgeon. And he is such a beautiful soul that he spent the first three years helping everyone. And when the nurses just gave Panadol for any ailment, no matter how bad, he would be there to help. He would counsel people. He would talk to the nurses about the medication they need. They said he was an angel for all of us, for over a thousand men in that compound. But increasingly over time, he found that his wife had passed away. One of his children had perished. And one Sunday he came, because you only have a telephone for 15 minutes, one day a week, to call back home. And in the oppressive heat on Manus Island, of course the men had to line up. So there will be a line of hundreds of men in the oppressive heat, standing, shuffling forward every 15 minutes, spending the entire day in the sun waiting to just speak to family. Can you imagine? Just for a moment. It's not easy for us as Australians. This is part of the problem. But if we can try. This day he called home 
and he was informed that his wife had been shot and killed. And he had two daughters. And he said, where are my daughters? And his extended family members said, we don't know. They fled and we haven't seen them for the last several weeks. Fifteen minutes was gone. He spent six more days contemplating that news. He turned up the following Sunday and went to stand in what was a line of hundreds of men, desperate to hear news of his kids. And you know what the other men did? They came to him and they said, come to the front. Come to the front. You go and speak, please. You're in more desperate need than us. Imagine. They went up to the front and the guard said, no, you must be in line. You must wait your turn. They said, we're all happy for him to step into our position. No, that, them's the rules. That's how cruelty operates. So he waited. He got to the front and he rang back home. There was no answer. He waited another seven days. It wasn't till several years later after I had met him in PNG, there when he was able to locate one of his daughters. But that was the point, was that we placed these humans in a position where they were so medicated, despite being so brilliant, that they couldn't get through another day without switching off their brain. And doesn't that say everything? That's reducing a human to the lowest possible level. You can't even think lest you be in pain. That's what we did. And now, of course, we're exporting this cruelty. You would have seen uh, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Home Secretary Suella Braverman recently echoing the language of demonization, the language of other. In their policies and pronouncements in recent year and just in recent weeks. In fact, we saw one of the heads of the EU recently say, we will decide who comes to the EU and under what circumstances. Do you remember that? Does that sound familiar? Rishi Sunak says we're going to stop the boats. I say it's not the boats who are in pain. It's not the boats who are fleeing. It's not the boats who are in trouble. It's the humans in the boats. It's easy to stop boats. Yes, it is. We've done the same. Suella recently said, the Home Secretary, uh, where individuals have been persecuted, it's right that we offer sanctuary, but we'll not be able to sustain an asylum system if, in effect, simply being gay or a woman and fearful of discrimination in your country of origin is sufficient to qualify for protection. Two of the most basic rights against discrimination on the grounds of sexuality, on the grounds of gender. Very simple. And now the most basic protections in place since 1951 under challenge. There are 64 countries that have laws that criminalize homosexuality, nearly half of which are in Africa. And so once again, we see policy decisions made with a racial lens. Recently, we've seen hundreds and thousands of deaths over years in Greece, Italy, and the criminalization of people using their boats to save others. All part of the policy framework that Australia had developed. The number of people internally displaced by conflicts and natural disasters hit a record high last year of 71.1 million people. That represented a 20% increase on the previous year. 71 million people internally displaced. 
and over 100 million people considered refugees around the world. That can't be stopped with demonization. That can't be stopped with racism. That can't be stopped with Navy interventions. And that can't be stopped by offshore detention. What that needs is leadership from Australia. What that needs is for Australia to acknowledge that our policy hasn't worked, that our policy has led to deaths, it's led to demonisation, it's led to destruction, and that we need to and can do much, much better. The future then that we're envisioning is one where all people fleeing danger are safe. In a sporting lens, as you heard earlier, recently I had the pleasure of meeting and being, helping to facilitate the arrival of the Afghan women's national football team to Australia. And yet, despite FIFA statutes uh, and their human rights policy of 2017, which obligates them to the Refugee Convention and to the protection of people, men in Afghanistan today are allowed to play football and play sport. Women are unable to participate. The Afghan women's national team have called on FIFA, including recently during the uh, FIFA Women's World Cup of such extraordinary success, to allow them to continue to play. Happily, they play for Melbourne Victory uh, here in Victoria and are a symbol of women's and girls' rights to participate in social, civic life, including sport. And as yet, FIFA are silent. We say that in order to be the force for good that sport says it is, it's imperative to uphold the human rights of all of those both within and without of the game, starting with the Afghan women's national team. Perhaps the future is where this team is still able to represent their country on the global stage. Looking ahead, the future must be one where the climate is cooling, not burning. And what will that take? Well, we talked about protest. It might just take civil disobedience on a mass scale. It likely will, given the power of the lobbies and fossil fuel emitting countries, including us. This week was Climate Week in, at the United Nations, and we saw Antonio Guterres, uh, the General Secretary, hold a special meeting in the middle of the week just for those countries who are acting in line with the Paris Agreement and with the commitments that we've all made. And Australia was not there. Nor was the UK, nor was the US. There was over 600 rallies all around the world last week of people saying, enough. And yet, Australia is still not moving fast enough. We're moving, but not fast enough. Not for us, and not for the next generation. Sport has a huge role to play here. FIFA is a member of the UN Sport for Climate Action Framework, which has five underlying principles one of which is to advocate publicly and use the social power of the largest sport in the world to encourage climate action from governments everywhere. It is this principle and this obligation that FIFA refuses to undertake. The International Energy Agency said more than two years ago that there should be no new oil and gas fields if we are serious about dealing with global heating and reaching net zero emissions by 2050. None. And yet, Australia is still giving the green light to new or to extensions of fossil fuel projects and over $11 billion per year in subsidies. The just transition to renewables has to be part of our future respecting human rights. And the research is very clear that every year we fall further behind, it costs our children 
billions if not trillions more. You also saw recently concerns raised by the Pacific nations about Australia's commitment to their future and our proposed hosting of COP31 in 2026. They're right to raise alarm, and so too should every one of us. Gender equality in future has to inform everything we do as a country. And that means, of course, safety from domestic violence and taking that seriously. The Matildas were a wonderful representative of different forms of equality that we saw recently in the hugely successful FIFA Women's World Cup on Australian and New Zealand soil. I had the pleasure some years ago of chairing the organisation uh, that represents all of our professional players in Australia, both Socceroos, Matildas and those in our A-Leagues and abroad. I ran a governance review in 2016 and it became immediately evident that the statutes of the organisation did not include women, did not have full membership for women and did not provide access to power or representation at the decision-making table for women, including the Matildas. We changed that. And only two years later, due to the outstanding management of some young former players and CEOs, and the support, I might say, of all the players, including every male player, the Matildas were able to announce the first legitimate, authentic a pay equality deal in all of world football. They went further than just saying the same payments to play or the same payments per day. What they said is that we will pool all of the revenue that players have access to with the males and the females and all of us will take an equal share. That was groundbreaking and how happy the Socceroos must be about that today following the FIFA Women's World Cup. <laughs> we saw from the World Cup even greater impact uh, in this regard when you all saw uh, the uh, horrific non-consensual actions of the then president of the Spanish Football Federation, his name was Luis Rubiales. And that brought to life an opportunity for real systemic change. And I'm pleased to see that the Spanish women's team and over 81 professional players refused to play on until real change occurred. It did take, though, the male team, who at this point in our history uh, have much more social and political capital, the male Spanish team, over two weeks to make their own statement. Nevertheless, shortly thereafter, and only a couple of days change occurred at the highest level of the Spanish Federation. The Matildas are now uh, standing in solidarity with the Spanish women's team and we're having conversations about what that means to extrapolate that change that we saw here and in Spain to the very highest level of the world's largest games. On the FIFA Council, there are just six women of 37 positions. Six of 37. My hope for the future that we envision is where all of sport, indeed all of Australian society, respects gender equality in all its forms. This week at the uh, climate summit with the United Nations in New York, just 24% of permanent representatives at the General Assembly are women. Just 24% of women had a chance to speak on the most pressing issue facing all of humankind. That has to change. Just two more points as we look forward. Firstly, that the Uluru Statement is implemented in full. And further, that we no longer fight over the impacts of colonisation. We no longer see the culture wars, the history wars, where the massacres the over 460 are accepted as fact and everyone understands the necessity for historical justice. Where we've spent decades working through truth-telling and we've closed the gaps. That has to be part of our future. Of course, the right to self-determination and to be involved 
in decision-making that pertains to them is a right of all Indigenous peoples around the world, including our First Nations. It is a basic right. The lack of civic education and human rights understanding in Australia still diminishes our capacity to deal with one of the two major questions of our time. We've seen a horrific level of misinformation and lies during this uh, referendum. And we've seen a resurgence of naked, horrific racism. We've seen that the concept of racism is one that Australia still in 2023 is not willing to come to terms with. And all of us must fight it, including white male Australians like myself. And why is that? Because like many of you, I never faced it. And sport gives me uh, access. Sport gives me representation. Sport gives me a certain social and political power. And like all of you, I have to decide how to use it or whether to use it. Recently, I sat on ABC television for a moment that said so much about our unwillingness to confront racism and our denial of the mistreatment of First Nations people over 235 years. I sat on air with uh, Stan Grant, one of Australia's uh, most credentialed, brilliant journalists, who also happens to be a First Nations Australian. And in speaking about the coronation and Australia's new king, Stan and I were talking similar language about Australia needing to look back to 70, 1788 and beyond and deal with the consequences and have an open, what we call courageous conversation. But are we truly courageous? And what we saw was some abuse, uh, which is normal, in social change uh, that I received on my social media accounts and others. Uh, but for Stan, a torrent of abuse coupled with awful, vicious, vile, racialized vilification. Two men, two Australians, Two prominent Australians sat on air at the same time, speaking about largely the same thing. Today, one had to leave his role to save his own mental health. But do you know how strong Stan Grant and First Nations people are? I'll tell you how strong they are. He knew it was going to happen. He knew before he opened his mouth that he was going to be chased off air. And so did I. That is the reality of Australia today. And that's what we need to overcome. The voice and the Uluru Statement is an historic opportunity for us to reach back in history. To reach back. We actually reach back in history to 1788 and join hands with First Nations. And say, we hear you. We get you. We are together. We respect you. We love you. And we want to make it right. That's all we're talking about. But whatever happens on October 14, we have to talk about racism. And finally tonight, and thank you for the opportunity to spend a few minutes talking with you. In future, we'll be able to say that we're proudly a republic with the strongest commitment, I've got here a stronger, let's say the strongest commitment to transparency, accountability, and to democracy. Bringing together our ancient past, our European traditions, and our multicultural demography. Strengthening accountability through a head of state accountable to us. Elected or selected by us, responsible only to us, representing us 
around the world, representing our value system of equality, of meritocracy, showing the world what we stand for, for that is what a head of state does. That is exactly what a head of state does. It shows the world what we stand for. It shows the world who we are. And hereditary entitlement and birthright has no place in Australian society today. The coming republic, I hope, is built on three main principles. Is reconciled, is fully independent, where we own our own country. First Nations and non-Indigenous Australians own it together. Where the sovereignty of this country is vested in you and in us. And finally, truly multicultural. And what does that mean? Truly multicultural. Australia is diverse. And we're very proud of that. Over 80% of Australians are very strong supporters of what we call multiculturalism. But you know, as part of the uh, Multicultural Council of Australia, we're having a conversation at the moment about even that terminology. It's just 50 years ago after the White Australia policy, when Australia actually started to allow uh, people from all around the world into this wonderful country. Just 50 years. And in that time, multiculturalism was an adjunct to the rest of Australia, the mass, the centre of Australia, which, like me, was white. That's no longer the case today. Today, is, today our face, wherever you look, except in power, <laughs> wherever you look in the street, in society, is diverse. But to be truly multicultural, that means breaking down the barriers for everyone. It means that no one faces any other barriers that we don't face. When we look to Parliament, we saw last year the most diverse Parliament in Australia's history, and yet we're still a long way off. When we look at the head of state, we see something that's no longer representative of us. Now and in coming years is our opportunity to say that true multiculturalism is that everyone in this room, everyone in this country, irrespective of background, uh, how long people have been Australian, uh, culture, ethnicity, religion, irrespective, any one of you has the opportunity to represent all of us. Real multiculturalism is access to power and representation. Where we look on television, we look at parliament, and we look at the representatives of this country, and we say, that is us. That's not yet the case, but I hope it will be. We deal with these issues and make Australia a beacon of fairness, of genuine equality, of merit. That, I think, is the future vision for Australia. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ah, God, thank you for such a... It's blown out all my professionally written notes, you know. Um, yeah, thank you so much for such a honest and courageous and powerful speech. It's been a while, Jen, truly for me, it's been a while to hear a public figure in Australia use their platform in the way you've done tonight. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very grateful that I, uh, and privileged to have been in the audience to, to hear, um, your speech. I, I, I hope that more people get to hear it and I hope you keep advancing this 
courage and powerful language um, across our country because I think we need it. We desperately need leaders that are courageous, that are ambitious, that are willing to get in the mess and create it. Yeah. I just wanted to say one comment that stood out for me in the speech is the story um, of the neurosurgeon. Um, and there's a remark you said about human beings having to shut down their thinking in order to not feel the pain. Or we forget, especially when we live in the privileged country that we have, is that we too are dehumanized by that process. We have to shut a part of our humanity to not see people break. And in acting for change, it is so much for the people in those positions, but it is about reclaiming our own humanity, to refuse for those acts to be done in our name, to be justified in our name. So I hope you always know that you too have a chance to use your platform, whatever it is, to create some change. Thank you, Craig, for inspiring us for this night. I have a token of... We do have a medal. Uh, it is not as glamorous as an AM. Uh, it is a picture of Sazelman. And at the back, it's just um, that you are our seventh um, orator. Um, and the first one in my role here. So, oh God, it's going to be a hard one. Thank you so much. Oh, I think I have people to thank uh, because I should. Uh, I'm happy to really thank the staff at Sazelman Cohen Center. Um, there's a few of them here in the room. Um, this Eva, who I don't know how you managed to help me manage the schedule. Uh, and you've got Annie, Rubina, Selkin. Um, so we've also got one of our uh, young research assistants at the back. Please forgive me, the names are completely out of my head. Uh, but I, yeah, there's a wonderful uh, range of stuff that help. I also want to thank everybody else who support us at the Selman Cohen Center. Uh, you know, Peter Zedlet is here, who runs one of our courses as well, um, and uh, Professor um, Kathy Luster. And I also want to acknowledge, you know, a number of women here who have worked with us. Um, the former judges from Afghanistan. And then to all of you for attending tonight. I know it's, you know, a public holiday tomorrow. Um, so I appreciate giving us some of your time and I really hope that this speech was absolutely worth the time to attend. Um, if I haven't forgotten anybody else, thank you so much. And if you have the time, please join us for drinks afterward. Yes, I have forgotten one person. Uh, I, I was going to thank uh, Kate Cowan. Uh, sh you make the effort to be here. Sorry, I miss you. You make such an effort to be here, you know, at our event. We're very grateful. Really, we are. So thank you for your presence. Um, thank you. All right, everyone, I'll let you get to the drinks and the food. Thank you again for coming tonight. And, and Adam Shoemaker. I'll kick you for him.